Okay, so we're looking at conceptual art. Um, one of the tendencies of reaction against kind of formalistic emphasis that was there, you know, we, when we were looking at artists like Frank Stella, he's like the archetype of that kind of art that's purely visual. And then there's this moment of breakdown or, or rebellion against that that leads to minimalism and environmental art, installation art, all these different tendencies, body art, that break with that purity. Um, we're going to look, we're looking at conceptual art, which is one of the big breaks with that. And I, even figurative art, you know, it starts to be, which of course existed before modern art altogether, becomes part of that story of one of the kind of reactions against purity. So looking at conceptual art and then kind of late, so a few later examples of art that's in the conceptual vein. It's really, there are really so many artists at work today that you know, one can only give you a very tiny introduction. I'm, I'm just trying to give you a few landmarks, either what I consider the more important artists, but also sometimes it's just representative of certain tendencies within it. And, you know, especially with the, thanks, with the increasing globalization of the art world, um, it's hard to cover everything. Uh, and I decided mostly to choose artists from a Chinese background to kind of give a context uh, China equals international in that sense uh, in, in the examples I've chosen um, but concept and you know that later tendency you could still call it conceptual art or you can call it sometimes people call it conceptualism or neo conceptual art something like that but just a, it becomes increasingly hard to specify what what is conceptual you know original conceptual art as we've been looking at so far tends to be very reductively disengaging from uh, visual pleasure but more recent tendencies that are sometimes being labeled as conceptual are not necessarily quite so detached in that way but here's one of those earlier examples Dan Graham and we're looking at his Homes for America, 1966. So it, you know, it, it's just an article with illustrations, with photographs reproduced in a book. Uh, I mean, in a magazine, I should say, sorry. Um, a commercial, ordinary magazine, not an art magazine, at least initially that was what it was designed to, to be. So it wasn't presented as art. It's a little bit like... You know, we're looking at that Coco Fusco work last time that was just presented in the street without the label art written on it. So in the same way this was initially so presented, though it has, and, and the idea was that it would just take the typography of the magazine itself. So it'd be like a chameleon that takes up the, the color of its surroundings. You know, it doesn't kind of stand back from the surroundings. Um, but all this has been slightly subverted because in later versions of the essay it was reprinted in art magazines and it had it, its own typography was kept rather than using the typography of the magazine as a whole. So it starts to stand out as a separate thing. So it's a very clear strategy of, of conceptual art that we've already met, the idea that words replace uh, visual images or in this case there are still visual images but they're very simple straightforward photograph and it's an essay about tract housing about sort of just ordinary mass suburban housing and a lot of the, this housing has a look of being very minimal to it I think it's part of his interest uh, so very dry sort of discussion of, of, of that. Um, it's all part of the story of escaping the white cube in different ways, escaping the world of art and trying to find other contexts for your practice. 
Um, you know, the white cube still survives, of course, even today. The idea of a pure, separate space for art, and sometimes art can do more with that. Actually, you know, it isn't that it's the second best. Sometimes a separation from the the rest of the world allows you to go further. You know, creates a kind of laboratory space where you can really focus down. And hey, sometimes it's not bad that some things can only be understood by specialists. You know, that could be the case. Nobody rejects science just because you know the man in the street can't necessarily understand it all. You know, even most of us might have trouble understanding the details of quantum physics or Einstein's general theory of relativity. You know, it's not that easy going, but we sort of take it on faith that it has a meaning to the people who who need to 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 look at it. So, you know, when art is at the edge of exploration of things yeah it may get a bit difficult at least initially for the general public but somehow we we often put pressure on art that it, it must be understood by everyone and you know sometimes it is and sometimes it goes out into the public space but not always Um, on Kawara, Japanese artist. He's been doing these conceptual works since 1964. So, you know, the kind of early 1960s is really that kind of breakthrough moment where so many different artists do different, uh, different non-formalistic things. This is from his I Went series, 1968 onwards, that this series belongs to. Um, he just has photocopies of city maps of the cities that he visits and he puts in red ballpoint pen on those photocopies a, a kind of indication of the routes he's taken on that particular occasion that particular day and the number of those maps depends on how long he stays in that city and then he puts them all together in transparent plastic sheeting in a loose leaf binder and that is the work, you know, it's again very textual. He has other similar projects. He did one called I Met, which is like a day, just a daily listing of, in a notebook of everyone that he met on each day. And other kind of documentations like mailing every day a postcard, telling someone the time that he woke up, that kind of thing. So like, more information than you you need of kind of kind of making a fetish of some unimportant biographical information rather than writing a diary where you say oh dear diary feeling sad again this morning because you know that kind of uh, emotive uh, diary content but he's probably most well known for his date paintings what he would do is just make a painting within one day and that painting would be of the date of that day just painted onto the canvas and if for some reason he couldn't finish the painting before midnight then he would sort of you know paint it out and start again you know destroy the work so you could say the, the, the paintings are indexical almost in the way like a photograph belongs to a particular time when the shutter was open and that will never change painting often has not had that kind of connection to a particular moment but he is interesting interested to, to do that he did uh, 823 of those apparently by the 31st of October 1970 so you know very common thing for him to be doing and it's a little bit similar to the project of this artist Roman Opolka uh, he's a Polish artist and from 1965 he had this open-ended series of canvases that began began that year of just writing down consecutive numbers in sequence on a canvas as many as will fit on the cam cam canvas that he happens to be working on uh, the canvases are a, a fixed size 196 by 135 cm and the 
paint is fixed as well. It's white paint on a grey background and the numbers are of a specific size. They're 13 millimetres high, painted with the smallest uh, standard commercially available uh, paintbrush. So all the works have this title 1965 slash one to zero one to infinity um, and it became a life project for him this is just the only thing he did for the rest of his life as an artist and he, so he thinks of each canvas as a detail as it's, it's almost I mean I think the parallels are more with things like uh, meditation practice you know repeating a mantra again and again um, This, we've seen repetition used by artists like Ad Reinhardt. In a way, it, it sort of has parallels to that. Of course, it's all about time, about temporality. We can see exactly when something was made. So in this case, um, this is actually... Uh, it's the battery's gone, that's why. not working well. I've chosen a very, what happens to be a very special one. Uh, this is the very canvas on, he, on which he, he reaches one million, um, which he did in 19, um, 1997, 1972, I think. And after he got that point, he, st to that point, he started to lighten the grey of the background slightly each time, add a little bit more white into the paint each time, little bit by little bit. So gradually, he ends up that he's sort of painting white on white eventually. And he started doing tape recordings of himself counting while he's painting. So you get his own voice and, you know, that gives a certain personal flavor of, uh, of, you know, mortality about it. Of course, that's all part of what it is. It's like a sort of memento mori, you know, the kind of like the Dutch still life paintings of the 17th century with their skulls, a sense of time passing, the limited span of a human life and what marking it out bare sequence Yoko Ono uh, this is from her book called Grapefruit of 1964 again you know textual based often they, they have a look almost like short poems since she's Japanese you could say kind of haiku like you know but they oh, they, they tend to have the form of being instructions let a vine grow water every day yeah. just do some uh, it's, it's like a, a script for a performance an open-ended performance but she's not the one in this case doing the performance she does in other cases conduct performances but she's also offering you potential performances where you can be the performer uh, that gets around the problem that we were talking about with performance art of from the from the audience's point of view you're getting a very different experience from the the phenomenology of being the actual performer and how much can you actually learn from from that uh, but if you follow her instructions, then you have a chance you can. So the book is called Grapefruit. Uh, of course, she, she's famous also apart from her, you know, her fame in her own independent right. She's famous because she was married to John Lennon of, of the Beatles. You know, so there's a kind of meeting of different worlds. And I've got my personal theory that, you know, the Beatles had a record label and they called their record label Apple. And I have a theory that maybe it was her idea since she called her book Grapefruit. It was kind of an unusual <laughs> thing in those days to call something 
after a fruit. Nowadays, it's very common, you know. So even Apple is uh, used again for a computer company or BlackBerry and <laughs> all that sort of thing. But uh, it was very strange at that time. So my theory is just based on the fact that she had a book called Grapefruit and that the most strange of the four Beatles names, Ringo, sounds like apple in Japanese. So uh, that's kind of, uh, that's the only evidence I have that, my, that suggests it. Mary Kelly, British artist, postpartum document 1973 to 79. Again, you see we're, we're with text, you know, deliberately avoiding visual pleasure. Uh, the idea is to push you towards a more intellectual engagement. As if pleasure is a bad thing, you know, you can critique, critique that notion. It, this um, is a consciously feminist artistic project, a politicized feminist artistic project. And it maybe it marks a certain stage in the mu woman's movement in or within feminism feminist activism where it's starting to get more theorized if you like or theorized in a different way um, so you know so some although it's actually around the same time there's a famous feminist artwork by Judy Chicago the dinner table that's more of a sort of consciousness raising project it's kind of like let's celebrate women, you know, and uh, the history of what women have done, that kind of thing. But someone like Mary Kelly's kind of feeling that's maybe not enough. You need to kind of, uh, a more kind of theoretically informed practice. Somehow, um, you know, that there may be a sort of essentialism involved in the Judy Chicago's idea of the feminine or something like that that needs to be critiqued. How do people become male or female? What's their social formation? Let's have a look at that uh, rather than sort of take the feminine and the masculine as sort of given entities. So postpartum document, she's doing it over uh, several years as, as the date indicates and it's a project with her own son as becoming a, a mother, documenting the mother-child relationship, well, more specifically, the mother and male child relationship. And it goes from after the baby is weaned, when it's no longer an infant, to up to age five. So it's during the period where the, the baby is becoming inserted in the world of speech you know it's a, it's a kind of key developmental phrase and her project is informed by uh, the theories of Lacan the psychoanalytic theorist Lacan Jacques Lacan so Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis sees this the unconscious as structured like a language it's kind of interested in the way language itself um, is involved with a socialization from a feminist perspective it's it's you know language equals the, the child being inserted in patriarchy the, the child is uh, you know language is associated with the external male world so it's a kind of moment where the, the child breaks away from its very close bond with its mother and she's documenting that, that kind of process, the process of individuation of, or, you know, of identity formation. That's how she's looking at it. So it's a conjuncture between psychoanal psychoanalysis and feminism, and I suppose actually Marxism. It's kind of a leftist project. Um, you know, that was a, a moment, the 1970s, where psychoanalysis and feminism were starting to come into a productive relationship. For example, there was a book by Juliet Mit Mitchell published in 1974 called Psychoanalysis and Feminism. But, you know, up to that point, feminism had been kind of uh, wary for the most part of Freud and psychoanalysis. Uh, but there they suddenly find a way of, of using it. 
So the, the work is made up of, um, you know, te text, uh, she's typing out on an old-fashioned typewriter, that was all you had at that point <laughs> in time, uh, the, 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 the ch child's first words or dialogue with her, uh, she's got um, prints of his, his uh, hands and feet or even his uh, nappies and things like that, nappy liners. Uh, his scribbles, early mark making, attempts to communicate with images. And, um, somehow she, she herself is there, but sort of more in the background, but it's definitely about the relationship between them, analyzing it. It's almost like a research project in a way, like an academic research project as much as a uh, an art project, trying to generate a body of data which then can be um, analyzed in some way. Motherhood maybe had not been particularly highly valued in earlier moments of feminist practice. So, you know, because motherhood was associated with the kind of traditional female roles and they were seen as limited. So this is sort of breaking beyond that in a way. Hans Hacker, this is his... Uh, Oh, let, let me see, uh, when, uh, one of her first projects, Mary Kelly's first projects, was called Wom Woman and Work from 1975. Uh, and she kind of is, again, like a research project. She, she looked at uh, the daily schedule of working class, working mothers, and exhibited those texts. And kind of what it, what it tends to show is, you know, they're much more interested in the time they spend with their their children after work, you know, then, then they're, they're not invested in the, the, the work itself. That's really kind of alienated from that. So it, 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 it starts to show almost, you want to say, a female fetishism about their fetishizing the children and so forth. That's where their identity is found in relationship to their children. So when she comes on to postpartum document, she's kind of applying the same logic, but to herself rather than to, to uh, kind of research subjects in a, a normal sense. And one of the things that she, in doing those kind of projects, one of the things that she cited as an influence is the work by Hans Hacker. We met him when we were looking at installation art, but uh, he's coming back again now with this MoMA poll. So it's one of the early examples from 1970 of what is sometimes referred to as institutional critique, where artists work within an institution but somehow want to work against the grain of that institution or expose what that institution um, <coughs> is, is doing, uh, try to give uh, viewers a perspective on that institution. You could say that's broadly it's part of installation in that, uh, you know, installation art wants you to be aware of the space of display as part of the artwork in some way. But this is not just the physical space, it's the, the social or institutional uh, properties of that space. So in his MoMA uh, poll, he's asking people to vote. There are two transparent polling booths, vote yes or no. Um, and you can see the question, would the fact that Governor Rockefeller has not denounced President Nixon's Indochina policy be a reason for you not to vote for him in November? Um, slightly convoluted wording for, for, a, for a question of a vote. Uh, but anyway, that, that's how, how they put it. it. And then, you know, everyone can see how everyone has voted. The reason why it's kind of an institutional critique is because the Museum of Modern Art was set up by the Rockefeller family and they remained, you know, and probably still do today, remain major figures on the board of that institution. Uh, American museums are very different from Hong Kong or British or French models of mu museums. 
um, in, in Europe you tend to find mu museums set up by the government. In Hong Kong almost all museums are government museums, even M plus when it comes in West Kowloon is sort of semi-governmental in a way. Uh, it's at arm's length from the government, it's a statutory body like Hong Kong U is a statutory body but as we know you know that nevertheless there are influences come from the government because the, that's where the funding comes from. Um, but in America most of the major institutions apart from things like the Smithsonian in Washington tend to be set up by pi private rich people so you know they may be, the question comes up to what extent they and their business and political interests are somehow infiltrating into what kind of art is collected or the way artistic stories are, are told. Um, and that's, those like, sort of questions certainly came up for the Rockefellers. Uh, one member of staff in the early days of the Rockefeller money came from Standard Oil Company a big oil, basically a monopoly, <coughs> oil monopoly. You know, for instance, uh, one example of a conflict of interest would be that um, uh, the original Governor Rockefeller, uh, he had big oil interests in Mexico, and then as a politician he was trying to get Mexican and American kind of trade deals going. So, uh, when Museum of Modern Art has a show of Mexican modern art, oh, is that kind of promoting this, the, a political uh, agenda or something like that? Even today, there's quite a lot of Mexican art there in their collection. One member of, of staff in those early days made a, a fake uh, invitation to some event called, and um, put the name Museum of Standard Oil instead of Museum of Modern Art. And she got the sack, <laughs> basically, for doing that. You couldn't talk about the relationship between the political and business interests uh, of the trustees and the, the, the art, art world uh, activities. So that's, you know, that's the kind of connection. It's Indochina, of course, means the Vietnam War. And that's what they're asking, asking you to do, to do, to give your opinion about that. Um, and the voting was very much against the war, you know, against the, the uh, founding family's member, Nelson Ro Rockefeller. Two to one, apparently, the voting went. Of course, that, that, just, that shows as much about Rockefeller, Governor Rockefeller, he was the governor of New York State at that time. Uh, it shows as much about him as it does about the kind of people that come into a museum, you know, it's, 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 it's only a certain social fraction that go, go into the museum, maybe they don't reflect people as a whole. Sophie Carr, again it, it, her, her artwork is sort of textual and photographic documentation. The photos are not arty photos, they're like just uh, very dumb documentary images, almost like a scene of crime photos or some kind of, uh, kind of photos that are of a type that uh, don't assert any aesthetic uh, property to them. So the work uh, is titled The Hotel Room 28. Uh, I, actually the, there are more works with different rooms as it were, but um, what she'd done, she'd had herself hired as a chambermaid for three year, three weeks uh, in a hotel in, in Venice. And what she did was kind of, she became like a de private detective. She kind of conducted surveillance on the occupants of the rooms that she was uh, supposed to be cleaning. Uh, she, she went through their belongings, open suitcases and so forth, and took photos of all the, the belongings. So very in, kind of invasive. Uh, then she made this photo documentation and there are notes of saying, you know, what, you know, what, did, did they sleep in late and all this sort of thing, you know, was the bed occupied, all this sort of thing. Um, there was a, 
interesting exhibition in um, New York in 1999 called Global Conceptualism, Points of Origin, 1950s to 1980s. It's the first show that really tried to uh, globalize the notion of conceptual art and look at conceptual tendencies in non Western context. So I'll just give you one example of a work that was in that show, Sildo Mireles, a Brazilian artist. Um, and in terms of social background, you, you need to know that Brazil was uh, under military rule. There was a military coup in 1964. Of course, that's now history. But this is art made in a, a kind of difficult, repressive moment. Uh, wait, obviously, it's not easy to um, to use the white cube as a way to critique the government directly. So he tried to find a strategy of connecting out into life. Uh, what he did was to silk screen his messages onto Coca-Cola bottles, you know, because Coca-Cola bottles are recyclable, so they go round and round in the system. So the, uh, uh, he's working within the system of capitalism, you know, and but using it against itself, which is kind of clever in a way, you know, not trying to fight a system that you can't fight, but use the use the energy of that system against itself, the efficiency of that system against itself. So when the bottles are are returned after he's silk screened, and the bottles would look like like this with you know you can't pick out the white writing against the transparent <coughs> bottle so it's only when the bottle has been cleaned and refilled that then the the the, the messages <laughs> become clear and the company sends them out all around the country <laughs> uh, at its own expense and of course coca-cola is a, an interesting one to choose because it, it sort of represents uh, american imperialism and all this sort of thing often those kind of governments were very uh, much in in cahoots with the the, the, the American government, like the, the famous case would be the, the 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 coup against the democratically elected government, but left wing government of Allende in Chile, that the uh, Americans uh, were 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 very much tied up with. Um, there's a very good film if you ever get to see it called uh, Missing by Costa Gravas, talks about some Americans in Chile at that time. Well, yeah, so more recently, sometimes uh, the notion of conceptualism has been applied to photography. Well, photography is, is a very visual, visual, it's a much more visually rich medium than te text uh, could be. And it's not photograph as just documentation like so Sophie Kahn is using. But still people have thought of this as conceptual. What it, what it is is this kind of stage photography of various kinds that he produces. It's not, it looks like a, uh, for a site, like a war photograph. Uh, there's a, this very specific genre of, of jour journalistic photography, war photography. Uh, but it's a staged version of that. Uh, so sometimes uh, this sort of thing is sort of as a conceptual tendency within photography. Now to do a sort of cross-cultural dimension of that, looking at a couple of Chinese photographers who have been thought of as conceptual photographers. Kang Xin, uh, My Traveler's Identity. Well, I think it's a very simple idea. He just persuades different people to swap clothes with him, you know, or not, not exactly swap clothes. They take their top layer of their clothes off and he puts it on himself. So it's a self-portrait of himself wearing whatever clothing, usually it's some kind of uniform rather than their everyday clothing. It's people who wear some kind of u uniform or costume and he, he has them stripped of that uh, and, and he puts it on. I suppose it, it, it em it's a, w a project that emphasizes how much we are, we become the role that we uh, adopt, you know, or it frees those people from their, uh, from their role. And we see them as an individual person. And it's all, it's a, it's a sort of private moment showing someone without their 
top layer of clothing on, but it's always in a in a public place. And his his wife, Kang Xing's wife, had a ran, uh, ran a very good Sichuan restaurant in the seven nine eight artistic district in Beijing. Pai Bo. Um, yeah, he takes photos from the Cultural Revolution era and then makes photos of the same people now, puts them together in a very deadpan way. You could call this conceptual photography in, in what people have. So it's a, it's a very simple kind of now and then idea. Some this case, yeah, we see two people and before and after. Sometimes there are larger groups and sometimes there are people missing and that kind of brings up the question of mortality and we start to wonder why they are missing. Is it something to do with the difficult history that they've lived through in that time? So clearly it's sort of during and after the Maoist era that's being compared so it's really a, a sort of <coughs> comparison you know is life better now or is it was it actually better then? The answer is not so clear cut. Oh, it's better now. You know, it sometimes people look uh, sort of happier in the earlier <laughs> photograph. At least they were younger. You know, they they have the sort of energy of youth about them, and the, you know, there's something appealing about the the relative naivety uh, of, of youth and all that sort of thing. So uh, it's it, it isn't a, a set up. So we're definitely saying that we're better now or that the, the new society is better. There is a sort of, as it is with a lot of Chinese contemporary art, some of it is a kind of deconstructing of the visual language of the Maoist era, particularly of the Cultural Revolution era, but some of it is also a critical look at the present moment, and sometimes using uh, the earlier moment as a way to do that. Well, that's often the case, I think, with this kind of, kind of art. Um, well, perhaps the most famous Chinese example of, of, of <laughs> conceptual art, Huang Yongping, or, or one of the earliest and most famous, the history of Chinese painting and a concise history of modern painting, washed in a washing machine for two minutes, 1987. So a very, very famous. Um, so it, it's a kind of moment of self-consciousness of. of an artist looks at art history, um, washing, well, washing has association of kind of cleansing and that's sort of uh, has positive associations, but actually it turns out to be a destructive activity, you know, rather than preserve, you know, helping to preserve by keeping something clean. In this case, the books just end up as a pile of mush. Although, interestingly, apparently the the Chinese book held up much better than the, the Western book, the Western art history book. So this is a moment where the issue of how do you, you know, how do you use all this new Western knowledge that was coming in during the 18, 1980s, suddenly the doors are open to Western knowledge and how do you use it? Um, there's so much of it anyway. And uh, you know, are you going to become deracinated if you if you just looking at all foreign things? How do you make it Chinese and all that? And this is like a sort of dumb approach to how you might mix the foreign and the the native. Let's just <laughs> put, them, put them together in a sort of physical way. Of course, he's he's interested in conceptual. Art. He's also interested in Dada. So that kind of absurdity of it all. Is, is a kind of a Dada property. But I, I, I see the same kind of thing with Xu Bing, you know, his famous book for the sky, book from the sky, Tian Xu, where uh, it's sort of Dada-like. It's an absurd thing to make this large installation, all of printed Chinese characters, none of which is a real character, all of which are kind of invented characters. Again, this is one of the total archetypal works of early Chinese contemporary art. On the one hand, it's very Western. It's one of the first installation pieces in Chinese art. Uh, and it has this sort of Dada quality. Recent contemporary Western art, like conceptual or installation, are, are, are coming into China then pretty much in the same moment as Dada. You know, they, 
people who weren't aware of modern trends at all because of the closure of the Cultural Revolution era, suddenly they're becoming aware of all of it in one go. So you're finding cross-fertilizations you wouldn't necessarily find in the West between Dada and conceptual or Dada and installation. And I think given that the form of it is so Western, the emphasis on a, a language which is definitely the Chinese language is a way of counteracting that. It's a way of saying, well, let's make something that is very Chinese about this at the same time, even if each character is not a readable character. And that was a very anxiety-producing thing to some of the earlier spectators. Remember, installation kind of multiplies that effect. You know, your whole environment is made up of your own language, and yet there's not one thing you can grasp hold of in this whole thing. You know, there's no one handhold that you can use to climb around in this space. Um, he, his training was printmaking. You know, in Chinese art training, printmaking is one of the kind of privileged, you know, disciplinary routes. Are, are you doing ink painting? Are you doing oil painting? Or are you doing printmaking? Or are you doing sculpture? These are kind of like the, the main sort of categories. Whereas nowadays in an art school, you say, well, are you, are you doing video or <laughs> you know? It's for the, but those traditional categories had, had were still important at that point. We're we're running low on time, but I just briefly want to say something about figurative art, which is the the last sort of major category that we haven't looked at. In a way, it's the most traditional category. It's the only traditional category, in fact. And of course, there were artists who went on using. Um, pre pre modern figurative idioms. Even today, amateur artists are using sort of styles that were popular in the sort of really in the Renaissance, even you know, uh, as ways of of working. They try to avoid modernism, but I think it would be very hard to produce interesting art if you did that. It just a kind of that's something you find more in amateur practice, isn't it? But figurative art have, has always survived. But but the interesting through modernism, but the interesting figurative art of the twentieth century and our own century is that art which is aware of the modernist experiments and yet still wants to to do it. It's just like the same thing with. Chinese ink painting, the interesting Chinese ink painting of the 20th and 21st century is that that is aware that there are other options, that it's choosing ink painting as one possible option and it's aware uh, it's not the only option. So figurative art that is often, and often in some ways that figurative art will be a response to more modernistic tendencies or have some kind of dialogue with them, you know, like certain, like someone like Huang Binghong making paintings uh, aware that there is modernism in Western art and feeling that his ink paintings are actually more close to the spirit of that modernism than if he tried to paint in a Western style like Xu Wei Hong does or something like that. So one example of that would be Lucien Freud, the British painter. This is one of his more complex figurative works, Large Interior West 11. After Vodo, what well, after Watto? Well, it gives you the clue. He's he he's making an image that sort of mimics the poses of a, a particular Watto painting. Um, they're, they're family members, people he's close to, portraits. He's primarily a figure painter. Just to give you a, a sculptural example, Ron Merck, Dead Dad, 1996-97. This is a, a, a kind of very realistic uh, representation of his own father after his father's death, but to a, a, a different scale. He plays with scale a lot in his works, reducing or enlarging scale. And it has that kind of un uncanny quality that um, you know that, that waxworks have I actually think 
Madame Tussauds was probably the um, most underrated female artist of her period, you know, actually, <laughs> if you think about it. In the 1970s into the 1980s, one of the kind of reactions against abstraction and formalism was a return to painting, all this kind of dis embodiment of the art world, dematerialization of the art world. There's a kind of reaction against that, a return to painting. It happens in American art. Artists like Julian Schnabel, for instance, but it's a moment where European artists really start to come back into the story in a big way. Um, maybe because they can draw on their own European traditions of painting making. So one key figure from Germany is, is Georg Baselitz. This is his Adieu of 1982. So it's figurative painting. There are, there are figures. But he has this one trick of always painting from a certain point in time. He's always painting. Everything is upside down. And that has a way of kind of making the image more abstract. That's the kind of trick a lot of artists might use while they're working on a painting. You could turn the canvas around and work on it from a different angle to, uh, to abstract it while you're thinking about it or get out of the habits of working in some way. Um, after, to begin with, maybe it's a kind of interesting idea. I, I find after a while it became a, a bit of a kind of bit of a strange kind of insistent habit to always have to have the imagery upside down. Anselm Kiefer, probably the most famous artist in Germany of that generation where painting comes back again. Painting equals burning, 1974. Well, there's this big artist cam uh, palette on top of it sometimes says writing as well. The notion of burning, like burnt earth, you know, there's, an, there's a term burnt earth policy. When an army is retreating, sometimes they would burn all the crops in the field uh, to prevent the invading army uh, from being able to, to, to thrive by, you know, by harvesting those crops. So there's a reference to, to, to kind of a land that is somehow troubled. For him as a German artist, I think most German artists felt they had to deal with history. They can't just avoid history. They can't be always looking to the future or something like that because of the, the terrible story of, the, of, of Nazism of the Holocaust, there's something there that they have to deal with and own as part of their own cultural history. So there's a need to, 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 to take on uh, what went wrong, what went wrong maybe even in, yeah, sorry, please go away if you have to go. I'll just carry on a, a few more minutes to say it a little bit more. Um, what went wrong in art as well, you know? A lot of the, so going back to use figurative styles is part of, partly that is about going back to explore the what is possible, uh, what was happening in earlier 20th century modernism in the period that led up to the Nazis. It's not the style the Nazis themselves used, but was there some complicity of art in what happened? This work. Um, interior 1981 that's explicitly more directly related to Nazism uh, in that he's he sh he's showing the Reich Tran Chancellery of Hitler the kind of key building uh, of, of the, the Nazi era I mean anyone in Germany would probably be really familiar with these kind of images and they'd be very loaded with associations sort of negative association or even, even a sense of kind of guilt about your own country's past. Operation Sea Lion 1, 1975. 
Sometimes he's painting over photographs and things like that. He's also making sculptures. Operation Sea Line was the name of the, the, uh, the Nazi plan for invading Britain, you know, which, if it had succeeded, would have been a key watershed in uh, success for, uh, for his project or anything. Your Golden Hair Marguerite, 1981 to 2. So again, this is one where there's writing on the on the canvas. It's again a kind of landscape and maybe a scarred wartime kind of landscape. And as he sometimes does add things to the surface, very um, you know, here applying straw. The straw is representing the golden hair of the title, Your Golden Hair, Marguerite, which is kind of written on the painting as well. There's also something representing dark hair. Now this, this is all relates very much to a particular uh, poem by Paul Celan, which was a, a very famous uh, poem about the Holocaust, which is the worst crime of the, the Nazis, the systematic cold-blooded killing of the Jewish population of Germany and the territories that Germany conquered. And it's a poem by Paul Celan called Death Fugue. A fugue is a type of, of musical form where there's repetition. And the poem has, you know, you could look it up, the text is easily available in translation. Codis Fugue or Death Fugue. Um, it's it, 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 there's sort of repetition like a musical repetition. It's like a horrible dance as well, the rhythm of the poem. And it's sort of telling the story of a, a Nazi overseer taking the Jewish prisoners out, getting them to dig their own grave, and at the same time some of them have to be forced to play music, you know. Um, and in the, this poem there's a reference to your golden hair Marguerite, and um, it's it, it's uh, your and to your your dark hair Shulamit Shulamit. The dark hair would mean Jewish hair, and the 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 the, the golden hair would mean the sort of typical Aryan blonde haired uh, type. And so that uh, that. Uh, distinction between the two is, is there in, in, in the poem and, 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 and brought into the painting in this way. So this is definitely a painting that wants to deal with the complexities of German history and does so by playing with, um, you know, via, via poetry in that way. Uh, well, just very quickly, looking outside the West for figurative art, Gordon Bennett is a sort of native Australian artist. This is his work, Possession Island, sort of after an image where uh, of kind of col colonial um, coming to take uh, take the land from the natives. Uh, but he's also overlaid it with a kind of Jackson Pollock style. You know, so you could, it's a typical kind of postmodern project mixing different idioms together within the same same word. Um, yeah, I, for some reason I can't, don't have the fan, the uh, Zhang Hong Tu work which is on your list of uh, where he's playing with um, doing classical Chinese paintings in the style of Van Gogh or Cezanne. But uh, I, I'm just finishing with Gormley and his Event Horizon Hong Kong. So it's a work that a lot of you may have had the chance to see, very recent work here in Hong Kong. Um, well, you could say it's figurative work, but it's very different from figurative sculpture of an earlier era because it has that, he's casting after his own body. So it has that kind of body, artist body interest that we've seen. We had a whole sort of theme about that, didn't we, when we were looking at performance and body art. 
uh, well, you could re relate him to that, even though it looks like a figurative sculpture. The fact that it was cast from his own body, and even the whole process of casting, where he, you know, t to be, it's almost like a death rebirth experience where you're sort of cocooned, it's, all you have is a little breathing tube, and you have to trust the person doing, doing the cast that when you're in, inside it, and you have to stay very still. It's for like a sort of meditative process and then you come out and then the cast is made and all of the bodies then are from his body they're all sort of emanations from him some at street level of course but most on the top of buildings and the whole project was delayed because someone committed suicide by jumping from the building of which was the building of one of the sponsors of the ex exhibition so it all delayed and even during the time when it was on display there was some people saying oh it reminded me of that that traumatic moment you know you should take those sculptures away uh, those kind of issues do come up when you make art in public space you know that you, you, you must expect a range of responses and to some extent you've got to you've got to consider your responsibilities in relation to those you can't always say oh those people don't understand art when you're moving out into a space where people um, have no choice but to encounter what you've done then you have to maybe think about things in a different way well that's just a very, very, I mean, uh, that's an, a, a, almost a bizarrely truncated indication of what figurative art has been in, the, in this period, but just uh, some attempt to try to map it onto the story that we have been telling. And I hope you do feel that you'll have an, enough um, landmarks to help to investigate um, art of this time. I definitely focus much more on the foundational period, the early part of the, the, the period that we've been looking at, uh, where there's a kind of breakthrough to new languages, because in many ways those languages are still being explored today. Uh, and I feel that's a, a more valuable strategy to try and give you an understanding of contemporary art than if I were to do a course just on contemporary art, where you know each week we look at one contemporary artist after uh, 12 weeks you'd know about 12 artists but probably five or ten years later you'd find that some of those artists are not the famous contemporary artists anymore anyway they maybe they're not so contemporary now uh, maybe some of them turn out to be not to carry on having uh, such importance you know if you if you take those books published to give you a snapshot of contemporary art 10 years ago or 15 years ago and look through you'll find a lot of names that now and not have not gone on to become more and more famous you know they, they, they faded so it, it's a very difficult strategy to to focus on contemporary art in isolation in that way and that's why I've chosen to to, to look at it this way but I hope you have some tools from this that will aid you with all the looking at art that you will engage with for the rest of your life that's one of the pleasures of teaching art history as opposed to, I don't know, accountancy or something, is that I, I, I know you can always go on and use this in your life no matter what job you do and uh, you know, you'll be a different person for having studied art history. Um, maybe you're a different person if you studied accountancy, but I don't know. I, I just know that uh, this, this will be good for you. So thank you very much.